the next few minutes, I'd like to share with you some recollections. Recollections of an event that I will never forget. Recollections of July 1984, when Sydney Harbour was the starting point of a transatlantic race to Liverpool, England. Recollections of tall ships arriving and tall ships waiting and tall ships leaving. This is the north end of Sydney just a couple of months later. It's quiet here now as I look across the harbour to Sydport, but a few months ago, it was a different story. The first arrival was perhaps the most impressive. This 260-foot, 54-year-old four-masted bark, which is owned by the Colombian Navy, is called the Gloria. Gloria's entrance was the most impressive. It was not that she was the largest ship, because she wasn't. It's what you just heard. Many of the 150 crew members greeting Kate Breton and song. After the Gloria, I sort of lost track. They just kept coming. One of the next ships was the Polish ship, the Darmojeji. And when it pulled into Sidport, there were 172 men on board, but when it left, there were a few less than that. Sydney wasn't the only place where defections took place. I think Halifax had a couple, and there were some in Ontario, I believe. Anyway, welcome to Canada, boys. I hope you like it here. The ship, by the way, had a lot to be proud of as it sailed into the harbor. In a race from Bermuda to Halifax, the Darmojeji won three prizes. As you can tell by these pictures, you end up looking up a lot when you visit tall ships. This ship, for instance, is the second largest in the race, 369 feet long, 46 feet across, with more than 32,000 square feet of sail. was impressive. Tall and black and big and Russian. The Kruzhenstern, a four-masted bark. It's the largest tall ship in the world, over 400 feet long, a crew of more than 235 people. And it goes back a few years as well. It was launched back in 1926. And in 1946, it was named Kruzhenstern. That comes from the first Russian to circumnavigate the globe. That was his name. I don't care who they named it after. I was impressed.
here I am at Sidport. It's a couple of months later in the fall of the year. The place is deserted, hardly a boat to be found. And just to think that right here... That was during the day, however, and into the night as well. If you don't like crowds, and I'm not partial to them myself, the time to come to see the tall ships, and perhaps the most beautiful time, was early in the morning, when the ships themselves seemed to be waking up. There's a song that I hear every morning Of the boats as they roll out to sea As the chorus rolls on The tide flows so strong Makes a natural seafaring song and it follows the tide down the channel In the wake of a fair wind to see With a powerful glide The keel that rides Neath the white bows that gleam on the sea this many people together at one place there's going to be a lot of people trying to make money right there's nothing wrong with that one interesting way you could spend your cash at Sidport during the visit was to pay about 15 bucks and take a ride in a helicopter and I have no doubt that everyone who spent the dollars were pleased except maybe for the agrophobiacs who I expect didn't get to see many ships at all just the floor of the helicopter As you can see, the view that it provided was exceptional. From here, you can see all the tall ships. The large Class A vessels stand out. There's the uh, Gloria, and the Darmogeji, the Krugenstern, the Sagres, and the Gorshpah. Okay, we're back on the ground. Summertime in 84 in Cape Breton. Well, some people, actually quite a few, if my memory serves me correct, felt that it was necessary to celebrate the arrival of the tall ships with a drink now and then. And for the more energetic, there were some sports programs organized. Cape Breton is a nice, quiet, serene, friendly little island. And that's what makes it so attractive to so many people. But when something like the tall ships happen, the nice, quiet, serene part is no more. I read it from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. This is a field just a few hundred yards from the harbor. An open-air church service is underway. And there was also a film crew from the BBC here producing a film of the visit. If you were to keep up with everything that happened for those few days when the tall ships were in, you'd have to do a lot of traveling. Here we are in Fortress Lewisburg. It's a Monday night. It's July 9th. And it's the location for a captain's dinner hosted by the premier of the province, John Buchanan. There he is now. Lots of food here, 
It seems that the residents of the fortress itself are wondering what's going on. They weren't invited to join in. Somehow, I, I don't think these two want to. The Canadian Coast Guard colleagues played a large role in the visit of the tall ships to Cape Breton. It's normally a quiet place, as you can see now. However, on Tuesday afternoon, July 10th, it was quite a busy place. Ports Canada reception was held here with dignitaries such as the Premier of the province and mayors of various towns in the industrial area and the uh, mayor of the city of Sydney. The Canada Cup was unveiled here. This time of year, there are only 14 icebergs out uh, off the banks coming down on the Labrador current. This year, there are 70, 70. And the the situation is therefore far worse. The captains of the tall ships gathered together in the Coast Guard Auditorium for a briefing on the race to Liverpool and the problems, such as the iceberg problems that would be encountered. Back outside again at the Coast Guard College. Perhaps one of the busiest times during the visit of the tall ships took place right here where I'm standing on the night of Tuesday, July 10th. This place didn't look anything like this. It looked like this. Right, food, food, and more food. The weather was great that night for the farewell to Canada party, and most events were held outside. Some of the events included traditional square dancing, rock music, barbecue, traditional dance bands in the gym. Lots of people ate lots of food, drank lots of something, and they had lots of fun. And on Wednesday, July 11th, it all started. I found a good spot along with thousands of other Cape Bretoners and tourists, and I waited for it to happen, the Parade of Sail. Leading the Parade of Sail was Nova Scotia's own Blue Nose. Feel her bow rise free of mother sea in a sunburst cloud of spray that stings the cheek while the rigging will speak of sea miles gone away. She is always best under full press, hard over as she'll lay. Who will know the blue nose in the sun? Now that's the Gloria. It's the only South American ship in the race. She left as she came, with the crew singing their way out of the harbor. Very impressive. This boat is known for its extended sailing session. It travels up to 30,000 miles each year at sea, and it can go about 60 days without resupplying. That's the Darmogeji, a three-masted, fully-rigged square rigger the second largest ship in the race, and it's also a very new ship, actually, built in Gdansk in 1982. Probably the only square rigger where the cadets sleep in bunks and not in hammocks. This is a smaller Class C vessel called the Darshachina. It's known as a sloop. the giant Krugen stern from the USSR. It was built in the 20s to trade nitrate between Chile and Europe, and the Russians took it over in the 1940s. It's the largest merchant Navy cadet ship in commission, 402 feet long, 46 feet across, with a 22-foot draft. Another Class C from the United Kingdom. It's a catch, the Halicyon. This one's also from the UK. It's called the Sabra. From West Germany, with a crew of 10, the Swansha.
smallest competitors in the race is from Poland. It has a crew of seven, and it's called the Stomo. Now here's an impressive ship. It's from Portugal, with a crew of 200, the Sagres. Must be nice to have the money. This is a private yacht taking part from West Germany. It's the Corolla. The Petter von Danzig from West Germany. Here they are together. The Italian Navy owns this one. It's a two-masted Bermudan yawl called the Corsaro. The last Class A tall ship from West Germany is the Gorschfock, and it's one of the best equipped ships in the world. It can reach 17 knots under sail alone. And that was it. The parade of sail over with, all that remains was the race itself, the most important part of the entire trip for the captains and crews of the tall ships. And they left as mysteriously as they arrived. They melted away in the fog. It's a clear, quiet fall morning here at Edwardsville in Cape Breton. The ships went past here just a few short weeks ago. God knows where they are now. I may never see a sight like that again, but I will always have recollections. And that's almost as good as being there again, isn't it? So does she not take wing like a living thing, child of the moving kind? See her pass with grace on the water's face With queen and quiet pride Our own tall ship of great renown Still lifts unto the sky Who will know the blue nose in the sun? Who will know the blue nose in the sun? Who will know the blue nose I wonder if they'll ever come back.